So we're here to talk through this castle wall puzzle from Palmer. It's one that actually will challenge you, or at least your notational styles, uh, to their fullest to see if you know how to mark things in a castle wall puzzle and track clues. It's not that it's per se too hard, there's sort of one major aha moment to get about the puzzle, but uh, if you don't know how you want to track what you're looking at, you may run into some challenges. Castle Wall is the one style where I actually make a kind of effort to shade which side of the loop I'm looking at, and because the black clues are on the outside and the white clues are on the inside, I will from time to time to sort of mark around the loop sort of which side a clue is on. So this is the inside here, touching an inside clue, it's all fine. Another kind of notation I make will sort of pop up here. These two clues see each other, so there's no more potential for a vertical segment over on the side of the grid, so I'll just mark those boundaries as unusable. And then with that as the basic notation, we get to uh, what I guess is the intro challenge to this puzzle, which is after marking those simple things, where do you go next? And while this uh, pattern that has some outside cells and inside cells that sort of all sit together suggests the loop is doing some complicated snaky thing, uh, the cleanest clues, I think, to look at and stand out are these ones that are almost done. So if we count up this section, there are eight vertical things to fill, but seven uh, to place. This also has eight to go out of seven. This one vertically has eight to go out of seven. This one coming down, now that this is spent, has eight to go out of seven. And so this is where, if you're doing this kind of tracking of which side of the loop on you're on, I'll use the letter W to suggest white or unshaded, but this is the inside here, this is the inside there. Imagine this were eight in this direction as opposed to seven in this direction. You draw this whole line. You'd see that opposite sides of the loop are pointing at the same kind of clue. And that's not allowed in this sort of puzzle. And you can ask yourself, what does that mean about when we're only eliminating one connection? For instance, we could just be eliminating this vertical segment here or just this vertical segment here. Which segments must be connected and which segments are where it must be separated? What you get is that if you had a straight line that went from this cell next to this white to that cell next to the white, you'd have a parity break in the puzzle. So one of these cells I'm circling, and this is an either-or notation I use uh, to track that something is breaking in this chain. One of these circled cells can't be filled in in this space. This top segment, this bottom segment are for sure. And that same pattern propagates in all the other places in the puzzle that also are sort of one away that these two clues, same color, in this case they're both outside. This was inside, that's outside, but same color can't be on opposite sides of a straight line, so there's got to be a break between them. In this section, these two clues are on the outside of the loop, but they can't be split by a straight line. And over here, these two clues are on the outside of the loop, can't be split by a straight line. You can get started in that sort of way. That's the easier part of the break-in. I think most people will catch that. The second is, we'll emphasize why I'm doing the shading of sides of the loop, is effectively when you have two clues that are connected by a path most of the way, you will always know which way this turns. Let me show you what I mean by that. So let's say this turn to the right. The shading of the loop is going to place these two on the same side and they're clues of different parity. This is outside, this is inside. It's just not possible. And so in this particular cell, we know it turns to the left so that this white side that we had up here continues over here. And so all of the section is white around that clue. Down on this side, this has to turn this way so that the dark inside is uh, to that side. Here's white, there's black. That's how that turns. This whole top section of the grid is shaded. In some sense, the outside is what's shaded. So coming from this side, that's also shaded. The top section here turns to the left. That's how it's going to complete a loop. On this side, we have black to here. So that's going to turn to the right, so we get the black and white separated. Over here, black is there. We need to get black and white separated, so that turns like this. Can do it over here as well. We've got black so far. It needs to become white. 
in this case, we actually, by having that turn there, we finish out this four clue. So I'm going to mark this off. It's another good habit in these puzzles to get used to marking off the clues you spend. Particularly a puzzle that's this large, it's just going to be challenging to know uh, what's the next clue to look at. So you always have to know which are useful, which are live clues, as we call them, which are spent clues. Having dealt with a turn for the seven clue, this one being unused, the rest uh, are trivial to fill in there. Uh, I don't think any of the other sevens right now have a turn, so we can't do that sort of fill-in for them, but we can come back to the spot we sort of started here. It looks like these ends will come together. On the top, if I actually do a count, I see I've already placed the four horizontal sections here. So we're not going to return to the top row anywhere else. Mark this into the grid. This corner we couldn't reach. I just marked that a few seconds ago. It actually now means that this three clue, which has one, two, three spots to fill, uses them all. It's always nice when you get a deduction of that form. Here there's just these loops need to connect to uh, come together, but again we could have used the shading principle if the left side is black, the white side, right side is white, this loop has to turn to the left so that this white side is the side that that clue sees. The seven down here has just two given and five left to go, so it uses all of those it looks like. This section here comes straight down. Let's mark off the clues we've now spent. Having put that turn to the grid, we can fill the rest of that seven clue right now. I'm looking in this space, and that four to the left doesn't have a lot of options for it anymore. It actually looks like there are exactly four for it. With this side, the bottom side being white, this loop turns down here. We can actually then shade across the top, uh, sign darken, and so one of the reasons to keep track of the parity of loops is in a normal loop puzzle, which doesn't have an inside-outside in the clues, you might think this end comes to the right, or this end might come down. Here, because we're coming from a shaded cell to another shaded cell, we can't have a dividing line between them. You can't go to white to black to white again in the space of a cell, so this must come straight down and connect, and that's a kind of deduction you should get familiar with in these puzzles that there are lots of times there's a one cell shoot between a clue and the loop and depending on the state of the cell right next to it you can say it can't be passed or must be passed but it's about the the side of the loop that everything logically flows from let's uh look now i guess sort of this six clue is one to think about we've got one two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you say, well, that still has one extra one to fill, but this puzzle has this setup where in the middle of long stretches that are one off, one of these threes that I've just circled has to be broken. But these are all good. And we can mark those actually in the grid and work from there. What else is close to being productive right now? It looks like we want to figure out how to connect these ends as soon as we can. Looks like we have, in general, um, if this is white and this is white here, we can't have a line segment that's going through that cell. And that's pretty useful to see. I guess actually there's a clue here that we could jump to which will get us that that cell's unusable in a second anyway, so let's just deal with this clue at the moment. It has just three line segments left to it. If we shade, we have to have white on the side. If this turns up, it's going to place shade next to white, so this has to turn down. So now we've actually made a cul-de-sac there, but either from considering context or other things you can mark that as unused, we finished this clue. Critical thing is now this eight down doesn't have a lot of choices for it. So it has one, two, three up here, four, five, six. This, uh, only one of these two edges can be used for seven. The reason for that is this comes down or it comes up, but we can't have a T. 
So the seventh is one of these two, so I'll use my either or section here, and this is the eighth. So the exact way this goes isn't known, but what we do know is it doesn't come to the left. So that keys into our either or chain here. Um, well, we don't know where the seventh goes yet. This must be a section, and this must be a section, or we'll never get up to eight total. This grid's now set up to get eight total, however I've filled down here, so I'll mark off the clue. I've made a connection here, so I've got another seven clue I can fulfill. A lot of the puzzle is kind of repetitive after you set up these one away steps, so it does get faster as you go along here. We have an end that connects up here and an end that connects up here. This one has to come down. Another way you'd see that is to actually just shade around it and recognize that. We put in this turn, so the rest of this either or space, now that we know that's not used, is clear. That mark off here, mark off here. I'm seeing the three clue looks good right now because we've just actually blocked off two of its options and there are only three left so it exactly fills that space. Let's actually do one more thing while we're looking at this. This is white on the left, white one cell to the right, we can't pass through there. It's always good to mark those if you spot them because you'll never know when that's a crucial thing about the loop. We finish this clue with those two verticals so just pass that information up, that forces that connection, forces this connection. Now we're actually getting a little bit of the loop shaping up on the side, so this is where uh, pretty traditional loop puzzle thinking goes, which is how is it we keep these ends from connecting together. These two ends closing would form a loop. So we're just going to keep in mind that those don't come together. Now it's these two ends that, that can't touch, but sometimes just the connectivity is always good to keep in mind because it will rear its head from time to time as you're going through a soul. Where are we at now? So we've got a few large vertical clues to still think about. One thing I want to do before I look at this nine is to think about this shoot between the loop and this clue. Again, we have the inside here. This is also on the inside. So that's not usable and critically it, it blocks off two segments. So now let's do a count from this nine. We have two, three, this is an either or for four, then we have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But again, in that whole group, we have this group, which is an either or. So what I'm seeing is two plus one plus one, a total of three plus two more, that's a total of nine. We've actually accounted for the whole uh, shoot by doing this. And so these connections are meant to make sure it gets up to a final value of 9. We do have to figure out something about this middle uh, bit. Critically, we also want to uh, deal with the color around this edge and see that this turns to the left. Having marked that, we can finally do something like we did in this upper left corner which is to cancel out all these cells that can't be reached anymore. You'll notice that now it makes clues that point into the space, and I think the five to the right is the only one that gets there. There's nothing coming down from here, but the five right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's gonna lose one clue in entirety. Normally we'd sort of mark this as the set of clues that could lose one of these three, but we already at the very early moments of this puzzle marked this as an unusable connection here. So you'd have to lose both of these together if you didn't come through them. That's not going to work. So those two must be used. This is the break. We get this. The outside of the loop is here, so this end has to come up so that the outside continues to shade this way. Get something like that in the grid. We finished off the four. We're still dealing somewhat with the nine, but things are starting to shape up there pretty well. We might as well look at these clues now. The sevens both see one section far away, but that means they see six in this middle group. That already has one, two, and then potentially three, four, five, six, seven. 
same pattern as always in this puzzle. Marks these, one of these three is unusable, but those sections must exist. And the loop must turn this way so that the outside stays in those bits and the unused is, sorry, the inside is there. Mark that clue off, mark this clue off. We have this five coming up to look at. We have this five coming across to look at. So let's count those. We have one used and then two, three, four, five, six total. Again, it's out of five, so one of these three is not used. Collectively, the remainder must be used. So we get this out of the scenario. We're shading those cells is inside the loop. We have another situation now having marked this. We have these fives to deal with this whole space. We've got one choice here, one, two, another two, a total of five. This all must be used. And so, honestly, a ton of the final steps in this puzzle are just bookkeeping the clues you've got, which probably are down to either one option, which sets up this kind of scenario, or no options, which sets up this kind of exact fill. So let's just actually do that again over here with the six vertical. We have potentially one here, this would be two, this would be three, then we get four, five, six, seven, but we actually know a little more than that. This now can't be used that can't be used. So this leaves three total of six. So those are all forced. Let's get our shading in. Which way does this loop turn? Again, it turns to the left. We now have an end that's going to come to this end, which means these two ends touch. That means of these four, this was the one that's not used. Same deduction as we've used throughout the puzzle. Push this as a loop. This has to continue straight through it. These ends don't want to touch. We can trace the loop back right here, put that in. We have uh, a little more potentially to do on this side up here, but we've got a pretty good thing going so far. I'm curious about this too, a cross clue. I've never looked at it because it looks so innocuous, but I'm not seeing anything horizontal yet. I can't get into the space again. It's got just one option to it. So I'll put that in now, having impacted this row, making that one unusable. The rest of that comes straight in. These cells won't be used. This will come down. You ask what's the next thing to look at? Well, I think we just have these few clues up here and these coming down. I've not looked at either of these yet. The three has two of its things spent, so it's close, but we've got an unknown link to make here. The two actually has one, two spent, so it's been fulfilled. We just didn't know we'd done it. We do now, so we'll mark that in. Again, one consequence of uh, marking those in is we can't cancel both of those. We have to cancel just one of them. Again, for this space, sort of following the logic we've been using throughout for this puzzle. Uh, down here, we have, actually, we still have a few options around these ghosts. We're going to need to know more about the loop connectivity up top, although I'll tell you what to suspect. These ends don't come together. They need to enclose the rest of this loop. So this right now is a part of the top loop, and this is another part of the top loop. So this is impossible. That will close off this section to be separate. So that at least is the next step for it. I mentioned the three down was one away. I just put another one in. So now I actually know it's fulfilled. That does this. This has to come up. This has to come across. So we finished that clue. Now we've got something like this. This end is not going to come to that end. That would close off the loop too soon, so it's here. We're down to just one clue not used, so this one has to drive the last step. We've got two horizontally spent here. I'm not getting into that cell, so this is three, that's four. Mark that up and we finish off this grid. Again, it's not per se too challenging. It's rather large. It's got one kind of deductions used all the time. It's based on the, the cool coloring of this pattern, but it's 
you know, a, a topology question, I guess, in some sense. Are you capable of tracking the inside and the outside of the loop? If you do that pretty well in, in this puzzle, you'll do it tremendously well in other castle wall puzzles. It's a really fun genre. It has some of the same uh, features to it that, say, uh, sheep and wolves do in Slytherin puzzles, where you actually have to track the inside and outside. So I enjoyed debuting it again uh, this week, having enjoyed it for several years on Palmer's website, and we hope we have more in the future, and that you'll uh, learn from this video and be able to do better when we have more castle walls going forward. Thanks.